I could give you five names. They replace the marketing lead and the, the marketing lead comes back to us and says, we want to be great at creativity again. What have we forgotten? How do we do that? And it's absolutely remarkable when I ask them, why have you decided to go, come back into the fold of creativity? And they say, because our sales are suffering. That is the reason they give, our sales are suffering. So the, the correlation between creativity and business success, shall we say, is so well established. I mean, we've got our own data about lion wins versus stock price, for instance. Um, and nearly all organizations have done this math, right? Because they're not going to invest unless it actually works. The problem is, of course, it's very difficult to do and difficult to get right. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, we typically have viewers literally all the way from New Zealand and Australia through to the West Coast of uh, North America. So uh, we're covering all time zones here and we're very happy that you're joining us live or in recording. Um, I'm also very, very happy to welcome today a special guest because as we run this session, we are counting down as the Institute for Real Growth to our Cannes Finale. And as many of you know, we have the days before Cannes uh, as we're gathering with about 130 of the IRG community, participants of IRG programs over the last three years, because we haven't been able to meet in person. And then at the end, we're doing our closing ceremony, our Grande Finale in um, the WPP beach, um, literally on the Croisette in Cannes. So it's especially uh, a, a pleasure to welcome the chairman of the Cannes Lions, here today, Philip Thomas. Philip, where are you and, and how are you? <laughs> Hi, Mark, it's great to see you. I'm very, very well, thank you very much. I flew back from New York to London, which is where I live. And I'm currently in the UK preparing, as you say, preparing for Can Lions in just a few weeks time now. My goodness, and, and before I ask you about lessons learned over the, the, the last years, tell us, um, is it looking to be um, a good Lions? I mean, there was talk that no one was coming and now it feels like everyone's going. How's it looking? Well, it's really surprising. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed, but it's looking really, really strong. It's probably going to be bigger than 2019, which is a surprise because I think most people, certainly most commentators felt that all events, not just Can Lions, but all big events would take a number of years to get back to the levels that they saw in 2019. And I have been really, really surprised, I think, especially in the context of CES. So those of you who are watching, of course, know about CES. And CES really got smashed by the Omicron, you've got to say that carefully, the Omicron variant. And um, a lot of people chose not to go. So I was obviously concerned. But in answer to your question, it's looking really incredible. It's incredibly strong, really great. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. I think uh, I think a lot of marketers are people. People. We're going to be talking about that today. And uh, there's an awful lot of a uh, lot of uh, pent up people connection. Um, I was doing a CMO summit in uh, in Sao Paulo. Um, uh, was it two weeks ago? And literally. Uh, the people, uh, the Brazilians are touchy-feely anyway, but they were all over each other because they were seeing each other for the first time. Um, Philip, if I may, uh, we've asked everyone in this program, um, when, when you look back, you've got a very unique perspective, of course. Um, what would you say for you personally were the biggest lessons learned from the last two years? Well, I, th I think maybe there are two big lessons. I mean, the first is that I didn't realize how resilient we all are, not, not just me, not just the business that I run, but actually all of us. Because our, if you, if I remember back to 2020, in March 2020, I, did a, I was doing a speech in, in Switzerland and I flew back and it, it was just beginning and I, you could tell something big was coming. And then when it really hit and it, the scale of what was coming really hit us all, I, I don't know, I just thought, you know, we're really, really in trouble. My business is in trouble. My people are in trouble. The globe, you know, the world is in serious trouble. And 
one of the great things, there are very few great things that have come out of the pandemic, but I think that realization that we're all maybe a little bit more resilient than we thought we were is, is a good lesson. And certainly the, you know, my particular business, as you can imagine with Can Lions, we lost 98% of our revenues that year, it just evaporated. So you can imagine it was very hard. So I think the first thing is that about resilience. And then the second thing is I, I did think at the time, I thought, well, I wonder what's going to change forever out of this pandemic. Mm-hmm. And I kind of figured I'm not sure that much is going to change forever. But I did think, and this is seemingly to be tr- coming true, that our work, the world of work is going to change forever. And, and that's on a scale that we haven't seen, I think, since the Industrial Revolution. So working out how we all engage with work i think every every leader that i talk to is grappling with this and i'm not entirely sure any of us have got the answers to how we go forward getting that balance between the flexibility that people love but also of course the benefit of being together right thank you philip um, as a follow up what do you think has actually changed then you talk about forever has anything changed forever in the expectations that uh, consumers, actually all stakeholders have of of business and and specifically of brands? Well, I think it's it's often discussed, isn't it, about brands' responsibilities to the greater good of the world, so to speak. And you could broadly call that purpose and how how much different stakeholders care about that. And clearly in the UK, I'm sure some of your viewers are aware of the discussions, shall we call it, uh, around Unilever's positioning with purpose, with one of their very large shareholders effectively saying these things just don't matter. Can you please get on with selling products? But the vast majority of organizations that I deal with are realizing genuinely that this is a really big change that people are looking. And I think all the things that have happened in the world really up to including the war mean that brands do have to step up. I think there has been a vacuum of political leadership over over certainly in the past, maybe not so much now, but in the very recent past, a big vacuum of political leadership. So I think that, that that expectation of what my brands stand for and what they're doing in the world is actually not just a panel discussion at Can Lions or Advertising Week. I think it is a, a genuinely important thing, but it's got to be done with care. I was talking to a very large, very famous marketer who everybody on this call will know recently. And they, he, he was saying, you know, in the, after the financial crisis, we got a couple of things wrong after that crisis because we're clearly in another one or about to go into another one. And he said to me, couple of things we did wrong. Firstly, we really pulled the price lever. So we started putting our prices up way too fast. We'll come back to this maybe in a minute, Mm. but we did that too fast. We're asking far too much of our consumers. And he said, the other thing was we doubled down too much on purpose. And I I was rather taken aback because this particular advertiser is quite well known for their belief in purpose. So I asked a bit more about what they meant by that. Mm. And they said, look, for some of our brands, it made absolutely perfect sense, but we were trying to shoehorn purpose in a, in a less meaningful way onto some of our other brands, and it just really backfired. So I think that's the balance that all brands have to have. But I think if there is one, and whether this has been caused by the pandemic or not, I don't know, but it's certainly something we're seeing. And there's an expectation of consumers to know much more about your organization. And by the way, it's not just consumers, it's also shareholders and other stakeholders, certainly staff as well. As this is this is your <laughs> I'm teaching you to suck eggs here, Mark. This is your big thing, isn't it? But that that's for sure a real reality. Yeah, I'm thinking about uh, what you just said, uh, Philip. One of the things that comes to mind is that just over the last uh, few weeks, we've had publications that are now open for discussion by the SEC, and there's an equivalent in Europe where companies are being forced to be very transparent about their impact on the environment. Uh, I think that's probably a a first step in terms of impact on the world around them, uh, the impact on stakeholders. And I don't know if you agree with this, but my suspicion with the great resignation going on is that there's going to be companies that have 
a lot of resignation and there's going to be companies that are probably better at creating value for their colleagues and are going to have a lot less trouble with the great resignation and therefore costs of retraining and rehiring so indeed i think you're right there is we're moving into a new era and the question is what's going to be on the dashboard huh? no that's absolutely right and, and and the whole idea of esg being a boardroom issue um is, is not necessarily particularly new it's relatively new but that's certainly what all the advisors that we have tell us about and most shareholders are demanding this is uh uh, but it's actually a good thing. I mean, I do think it's a good thing. And, and, and a lot of it comes from the human beings that are running these businesses. You know, I often get asked, do these marketers really mean it when they talk about purpose? And, they, and, and I think they mean it for two reasons. One is they can actually see the impact on their bottom line. and on the. On, on, but actually, they're also human beings who actually do genuinely care. And as many marketers have pointed out to me in the past, Marketing has the most power in the world. You know, <laughs> marketing communicates with billions of people every single day, every single hour of every single day. So the the responsibility that we have is absolutely phenomenal. I think I think people running marketing organisations are human beings who don't want to do bad things; they want to do good things. So, so you mentioned there's some brands that get it right, and 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 there are also uh, some companies that try to push brands into places where they weren't supposed to go. Um, I'd, I'd love some examples. So we're doing something new to the viewers. We're actually going to um, have somebody listen in and then very quickly uh, gather the footage of, of, of what we're talking about and show it to you and share it. But um, Philip, when you think back and especially brands that have stepped up and that have impressed you, what, what are you thinking of? Yeah, I mean, there are there are some that get it wrong, but obviously the ones who make it to the can lines get it right. I mean, I just want to reference two slightly older pieces because I think they were game changers and both by very, very big uh, organizations. The first was this girl can from um, Procter & Gamble. And what that did was just honed in on a really universal Kind of experience that everybody had all genders understood exactly what that piece of work was about and what it was trying to say show me what it looks like to run like a girl and there was an empowerment yeah. element of it that really went very very brilliantly in like hand in hand with the brand and then the other one was uh you know dove's true real beauty campaign has been going for many many years um, very, very famous winner from Canada a few years ago about retouching on magazine covers. Um, but the one I'm thinking of is the is the uh, the drawing of the individual as she describes herself, and then the comparison with the drawing of her as her friends describe her. This is the sketch that you helped me create, and that's a sketch that somebody described of you. So yeah, that's. And again, it's a universal understanding, but critically it was in keeping with the brand promise and, and over time that belief in real beauty and a kind of unerring sticking to that as a really meaningful piece of purpose. And, when, when, and, and if you look at what's true of the brands that get this right, they have that spine of quite often a very simple single truth, which is we stand for real beauty in women. But out of that single strand of truth can come many, many, many different ideas. And I think that's what the great marketers do with their agency groups. They, they really empower them to play in that area. Um, and it's almost as if the, the power of the single truth just allows these agencies to, to really be creative. Um, but I think one of the ones from last year that really stood out was the MasterCard transgender name idea, mm. which won big, it won a Grand Prix at Cannes. And the problem there was that if you're non-binary or transgender, banks would not allow you to use the name that you wish to use on your card. And that, that seems like a relatively small thing, but actually for the individual's concern, it's a really, really big thing. Mm. And what they did was they allowed people that freedom 
and they position themselves as an extremely powerful organization that actually could make a change in the world, albeit to a small number of people, but a huge change to a small number of people. And those are the kind of ideas that really resonate and really take brands forward. And we see it a lot uh, at the festival, but that was one that really came out uh, for me last year. I think we both agree on the brilliance of those examples. I, I, I want to zoom in more to uh, your um, homeland, uh, creativity, the Cannes Lions Festival of Creativity, uh, because at the IRG in our program, just recently we had a session that was all around balancing or rebalancing analytics and creativity. And the premise of the session was really that when digital came sort of, you know, around the 2000s and became dominantly available, uh, people started having a choice and suddenly everything became measurable, at least supposedly everything became measurable, which touched a um, chip on the shoulder, a nerve with marketers that for decades had been sort of been made fun of as the discipline that spends most, but knows least about effectiveness of its spend. And that was somehow there was a, an overreaction into digital and, and that creativity got lost in the way somehow. And this is a much bigger debate, of course, and perhaps it's now reversing with a vengeance, but I'd love your perspective on, on, on what's happened uh, between these two. Yeah, it's a huge subject. A couple of data points. Amazon, which is uh, uh, effectively, it's like the, the emblematic performance marketing platform, right? So Amazon could live very, very comfortably just selling itself as a performance marketing platform, right? So you can maximize your sales on Amazon by simply using data-led, digital, simple, non-creative marketing. Amazon are coming to Can Lines this year in a really, really, really significant way. And I suppose the question there is, well, why would they do that? Yeah. And I think they're doing it because Amazon are a very smart company and they realize that the sea change has happened already. And what they want to be able to do is engage with marketers and, and, and agencies on how their platform can build brands and can allow creativity to, to flourish. So that's one data point. I mean, I've been on Canline since 2007, so 2006. So I've seen the flow and the ebb of this. And interestingly, quite often, it's not even about data versus creativity. Sometimes it's just about individuals, right? So you'd be absolutely astonished by the number of global organizations who have come to us worked on a program of creativity, seen the success, seen the upside of it, and then one particular individual has been replaced by somebody who doesn't believe in it so much. And then the commitment to creativity goes down. But quite often it's about leadership. This is a really important point. Often it's about leadership. And so I could name five off the top of my head, five global marketers who've done this, right? So they have a moment in the sun, they're very creative. And by the way, they're also very successful from a business perspective because there is actually a correlation. Mm -hmm. Somebody comes in to lead the organization, doesn't believe in it so much. Number of lions they win goes down, creativity goes down, but there's a lag. So it's a lead indicator, but there is a lag. So business is actually doing okay, even though they're not investing in creativity. And then suddenly it starts to drift. And then what happens, and again, I could give you five names, they replace the marketing lead and the, the marketing lead comes back to us and says, we want to be great at creativity again. What have we forgotten? How do we do that? And it's absolutely remarkable when I ask them, why have you decided to go, come back into the fold of creativity? And they say, because our sales are suffering. That is the reason they give, our sales are suffering. So... The, the correlation between creativity and business success, shall we say, is so well established. I mean, we've got our own data about lion wins versus stock price, for instance. Um, and nearly all organizations have done this math, right? Because they're not going to invest unless it actually works. The problem is, of course, it's very difficult to do and difficult to get right. 
So now when you come to, well, the real nitty gritty of the tension between data, performance marketing, you might call it, and, and, and brand building, let's call it that. Um, obviously, you've got to do both. Everybody knows, everybody understands you've got to do both. Um, and the percentages vary. Some people say 40, 60, some people say 60, 40. There's got to be both, obviously. But in the long term, all the evidence and all the data would suggest that a commitment to creativity will grow will grow your business going forward. And the reasons are not hard to understand, are they? Because what do we really mean by creativity? Creativity is the production of something that is of interest, of entertainment, that is attractive to audiences, right? So it's telling stories in an entertaining, meaningful way that will grab people's attention. We all know we're living in an attention economy. Scott Galloway talks about this very, very well. Uh, current scroll on TikTok is 12 seconds. So you've got 12 seconds really on TikTok to, uh, to gather anybody's attention. So how are we going to counter that? The only way to counter that is to tell really engaging, really powerful, meaningful, emotional, interesting, funny stories through creativity. So the final data point before I shut up and we can talk in more detail is when you look at what happens at Can Lions, it's really, really interesting. So the first thing is that the number of marketers coming to the festival is growing exponentially year on year. And this year we have more than ever. I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary. I think currently we've got 93 of the top 100 spenders in the world uh, and many, many, many thousands more. So they're coming to learn about creativity. Now, how do I know they're coming to learn about creativity? Because in 2019, we had an app. And if you, if you opted into the app, we could track your, your movements around CAN because we wanted to do that so we could make the experience better for people. So most people opted in, they were fine. And when you look at what people are doing, it's very interesting. Marketing people are spending the most time in the Palais. So in the Palais, of course, we have you can view the work, you can listen to speeches, you can go to the award shows. It's all about creativity. And the marketers are spending eight, nine, 10 hours a day in the Palais. So we kind of got, we've got data points that tell us that marketers want to learn about creativity or to learn how it can build their business, how it can help to drive things forward. And it's certainly gathered pace in the last few years. All, all, our, all our information would tell us that. Anecdotally, we hear from agencies that marketers are telling them they'll get bonuses if they win Lions. They, you know, they want to win Lions because they understand the link between creativity and business success. So it's a, it's a, it's a real, I don't think it ever went away, but as you say, there was a period when it went down, but it's now coming back in a really big way. So, so Philip, uh, this is probably best brought to life with examples. What, what is an example of a brand that, that, that sort of lost its way and came back? I wouldn't say, well, I don't want to accuse any brand of having lost their way. I suppose you could say decided on a different course. That might be, <laughs> might be better. Um, uh, McDonald's. McDonald's is a great example. McDonald's were the ones that proved, they were the first actually that came to us and said, we've done some analysis. And the work that wins Lions is 52% more effective than the work that doesn't win Lions. In other words, creative work for us at McDonald's, we've done the measurement, is 52% more effective. Now, then McDonald's, change of personnel, change of focus, went away. And then recently they're coming back in a big way. Heineken, I'm sure they won't mind me saying as well. Heineken, uh, Can Lions Marketer of the Year, about 2012, just doing the most fantastic work. Um, change tack, so to speak, you could say. Creativity very much took a back seat. Um, and now they're back very much to, to creativity. Uh, AB InBev's a really interesting live example because obviously before the merger, some of that work with Budweiser was some of the most famous creative work ever, definitely lost their way, came to us five years ago and said, we, we really want to get good. And they put their money and their time and their energy where their mouths were. And they've had this incredible success since. Um, 
And it's interesting because I, I spoke to Fernando Machado when he was at Burger King about this. And I said to him, I can't understand, because his owners, obviously very famous, famously not keen on spending a lot of money, keen on cutting costs, I think it's fair to say, the owners of Burger King at the time. I said to him, I, well, I don't understand why your owners let you spend so much money on all this amazing creative work. It's like, why would they let you do that? Is it, you're just very persuasive or what? And he said, no, Phil, you got it the wrong way around, totally the wrong way around. They would never give me the money if it didn't work. They would never, you know, it's because it works that they give me the money. I've proved it works over and over and over again. So they will invest in my creativity. That's um, so cool. Yeah, and it's, it's just, I, I just got the wrong end of the sticker. Of course, that's true. <laughs> well, it, it's funny you said that because last week in the IRG 100 program, we had um, a Chris Burgrave, you may remember, he was the CMO there. And uh, he has written two books about marketing and finance. And basically his big point is you need to speak their language to convince them of the business case. And, uh, and I think you're, you're talking about uh, Fernando doing that. We had uh, Miguel Patricio, uh, on one of our humanizing growth series before you, who um, blatantly stated, I have briefed my teams to go win can lines. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But you've hit on something so important there, which is about the language. So um, Raja from MasterCard, I'm sure you know Raja very well. Um, I was listening to him talk once and he, he made this fantastic point that really marketing leaders need to make sure that they are completely aligned with the KPIs of the CEO and the exec co. Because one of our biggest problems is the misunderstanding between the boards and the marketing teams, the CMO, so to speak. So as a kind of crass example, a CMO might be very excited about the NPS score or the, uh, the brand saliency of a particular brand or and, and the ceo is saying but where are my sales you know what's happening here about where's my profitability and getting alignment right what are we both going to be measured on and let's get together on what we think is important what leads to what and how we can measure ourselves on that together raja was very compelling about the critical importance of that and i completely agree and one of the sad things about our industry is that sometimes agencies are fighting with marketers. So agencies are like, Mark, my marketer doesn't understand me. They won't let me do creativity in the way I want. And there's this tension between the marketers and the, and the agencies. But if I ever get a chance, I say to them, no, no, you're on the same team. <laughs> you need to work together to work to persuade the boards, the finance people, CEOs, whoever it may be, of the power of what you do and don't fight amongst yourselves gather data gather the proof gather the proof points gather the information that you need in order to make these arguments so i, I completely agree is the the language there are three bits of problematic language we found as we talk to the different groups do agencies and marketers talk the same language of creativity right sometimes definitely not we can come back to that and then the marketers and boards talk the same language. And the answer to that is almost always not as well. And so that's a really important point. So, for example, one brand that has really been on the most fantastic journey is AB InBev. And they won a number of big lions last year, including uh, the Grand Prix in PR for the Contract for Change, which was their uh, attempt to help farmers with organic farming and, uh, and actually investing in that and it was just again such a rounded idea based in the fundamental truth that they hold and another great example of how a brand can um, really get to the heart of making a difference in the world and doing things uh, for the world rather than just for one particular set of stakeholders. Now Philip I was listening to you talk about the ABMF work and um... It struck me, uh, you probably saw it in the introduction video at the beginning of this uh, conversation, um, that somebody we both care dearly about, uh, but lost uh, over the last month, uh, Jodie Harris. Um, she was in the very first IRG 100 cohort. 
And I'm guessing that she was probably involved in some of this work. Am I right? Yeah, very, very much so. Jody was our main point of contact uh, in the program that we ran for AB InBev. They worked with us for four or five years. And we were involved uh, more or less on a daily basis. And it was Jody who drove that whole creative agenda of change. And she almost single-handedly changed that organization and is responsible for so much of the great work that she that that was produced by AB and Bev, with lots of support from Maurizio and others as well, of course. But um, you know, it, we're all very we're devastated really by by losing Jodie, because apart from everything she did from a work perspective, she was also an absolutely wonderful person, as as we all know. And I've spent time with her in Dubai and in Cannes and in London and New York, um, as I'm sure we all have. So we just feel for her family so much. With a young family, it's just, a, yes, terrible. A, a huge change leader of the industry. Jody Harris, you will be missed. Okay. Um, so Philip, you, you, you mentioned, you talked a little bit about the, the, the profile of the, the leaders and you know that as part of IRG, we've developed a, a profile of what we call the Da Vinci growth leader. We did that together with Greg Welsh and uh, Tom Seclo and the whole team at uh, Spencer Stewart, making the point that it really is about left brain, right brain, but also heart. Um, that humanistic, uh, or as the Institute for Real Growth calls it, humanized growth perspective. As you look at the marketing leaders of the last generation, what changes do you see? Well, I, th I think it is this, that they, they have become these very, very rounded leaders, very rounded business people. I remember, I remember really vividly in about 2010, there was a speech from Ogilvy, and I remember the exact words used. The CCO of Ogilvy said words to the effect of marketers these days have got an enormous amount on their plate. And if you fast forward to 2022, <laughs> in 2010, really, they had hardly anything on the plate compared to now. <laughs> so I think, I think, you know, my first point about marketing leaders is I just think the job they do is incredibly difficult. And I've filled with respect for them being able to do it because we've already touched on some of the relationship issues. They've got to be able to understand their agencies and deal with their agencies, inspire their agencies, get the right agencies. And then they've got to manage the stakeholders with, within the board and the CEO as well. And that's just, that's just table stakes. You know, after that, you've got, you've got the balance between data and analytics and, and performance marketing versus brand yeah, you've got the purpose. How can we make sure we're really genuinely authentic? You stand for the brand. Often you represent the brand, don't you? You represent your company in many ways on stages around the world or whatever it might be. I mean, the breadth of quality that you need as an individual to be a successful marketer is, is, is absolutely amazing. And the CFOs of this world would do well to, to remember that sometimes. The pressure is absolutely phenomenal. Um, but I think the hu your humanizing point is a, is a really great point. If you think about the marketers who've really made an impact, they tend to be really great humans. So, you know, without you know, name a few people, Jonathan Mildenhall, you know, Mark Pritchard, these people, Antonio, as, as you mentioned, you know, these people are known to be just great human beings as well. And I think that is something that we see more and more of. But it is this breadth of I think you've got to be a real polymath. You've got to be really able to play any part of the field to be a really successful marketer these days. Yeah, it's interesting. I was at the um, induction um, in the, to the Hall of Fame of Mark Pritchard and Antonio Lucio. It was the same ceremony. And uh, I don't think he would mind me sharing that uh, uh, some tears were shed, uh, significant ones. You're talking and you're listening in those moments to leaders that really bring their heart to work. Mm -hmm. And that is a big contrast to uh, 20 years ago when we had these big ego um, fame uh, C uh, CMOs. Huh? Um, yeah. Speaking of Antonio Lucio, there's a point he makes, you know, his last role was at Meta, of course. And uh, there's a point he makes to us as an industry that um, 
really so many of today's marketeers are actually in the new economy, are in the B2B economy, are not in the traditional CPG. I think he, his point is it's about 20% of all marketeers that are you know, in the CPG. But the language and the themes we discuss perhaps are 80% CPG led. Do you have a perspective on that? Yeah, definitely. Lions, Can Lions for 68 years, 67 years has been B2C with a couple of little exceptions, bits and pieces here and there. Some of the farmer lions are B2B, but broadly. So this year, as people might know, we've launched the B2B lion. Now, this is something we've talked about. Literally, I looked in my files and we started talking about this in 2012. So it's 10 years in the gestation. Maybe we're a little bit late to the party, perfectly happy to accept that. But now is definitely the time. And the response has been really interesting. I think it'll probably mirror our health lions. The reason we launched the health lions, particularly the pharmaceutical lions, was to help in this argument about creativity, right? It was to, it was to help to unleash a certain amount of creativity in what is an, an environment that's quite hard to be creative for various reasons. Now, B2B isn't like pharma, so it hasn't got the restrictions of pharma, but sometimes it has the same kind of mental straitjacket. And so what we're trying to do is uncover within our B2B lines, this is so much more than, well, everybody's got to be treated like a human. We're all humans. Let's market as if people are a, a CPG clients. It's much more about how can you unlock creativity to really drive B2B decision-making and B2B businesses. And the response has been amazing. We're, we're partnering with LinkedIn on it. And people are very, very keen and very, very interested. Mm. What will be so interesting is to see, uh, I predict probably maybe year one, the work will be kind of okay. But in five years time, the work will stand up against the, uh, the B2C work at Can Lions, definitely for sure. So it's, it's interesting that, that's come up for you as well, because it's, it definitely came up for us, which is why we're launching the B2B Lions. Well, and all credit to uh, IRG partner from day one, Jan Swartz at LinkedIn, for having uh, fought that battle and now having raised it to this level of uh, attention. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Jan's been a, a, a real driver for this, and uh, we value the, the partnership because it's very, very helpful. Philip, I'd like to zoom in even further on creativity and specifically driving creativity within the organization. Now, I know that's not typically where you look, but perhaps you do deal with the results of that. Are there any examples that you can give where companies or marketing leaders have managed to do that well? Yeah, lots of, lots of examples. And I think well, the first point is it does, it does actually start with leadership. So all of our data comes back to leadership and the marketing leader genuinely believing in creativity. So without that, it sounds, sounds kind of obvious, but without that, you're not gonna get anywhere. The other thing is to, I think, remove the barriers to risk and, uh, and concern around what happens if it fails. So, so some of the really successful moves in, in recent years have been organizations choosing to experiment and see what happens. So to give you one small example, mm -hmm. Coca-Cola, they went through a period where they won quite a lot of lions, but they did not risk their US television budget on crazy creative ideas. What they did was they would go to either a particular market or they choose one particular brand within their portfolio. So in the case of, in the case of uh, Coca-Cola, they were trying to come up with an idea of you've got a Coke, it's great to share, but people maybe don't want to share the same can. So in, a, in Singapore, they designed a can that came apart. You split it apart, one for you, one for me. Now, that was just a little tiny idea in, in, in Singapore. It won a number of lines. It became very famous. Next thing we know, they're rolling it out in China as a product idea. If you take things like Unilever, if you take a company like Unilever, Unilever don't risk their entire portfolio on creativity. What they do do is they say, as an example, Lynx and Dove 
we we need you to be our inspiration so you take these risks you win these lions you win these awards and we will see what's possible now our other brands may not get to your level but you're taking us all with you but we're not risking the entire thing so i think i think managing the fear of risk is really important in in all of this so there's no need to terrify the cfo <laughs> you, you can do it bit by bit by bit so that's yeah. the first thing second thing is what are the align what is the alignment of who gets rewarded because quite often I see what will happen sometimes is I'll go to a particular country, let's just pick Austria as an example, and I'll be giving a speech about how a large global advertiser truly believes in creativity. And someone will come up to me afterwards and they'll say, I work with them in Austria. And I can tell you now, none of their KPIs are linked to creativity. They don't care about creativity. You're, you're just talking in, and I don't even know what you're talking about when you say these people believe in creativity. So the problem there is there's no alignment in the KPIs and the benefit that people receive. So maybe the central people will get some kind of bonus if they win some Cam Lions, but the country manager down in Austria is going to get nothing, right? So again, that alignment of KPIs and benefits is really, really important. So I think there are there are a number of different. Obviously, there's a, you can people have written books about about how to create creative organisations, but there are just a couple of little things that I see when it works. Yeah. It has leadership. They don't bet the farm. They play. They risk. They experiment, and they align their benefits. And those are just three quick thoughts on that one. Philip, a lot has been said about uh, driving creativity within the organization, but of course, most companies work with agencies. Um, and sometimes these agencies are actually internally, but often they're not. What can you tell us and get as practical as you can about how to foster creativity in the agencies, how to celebrate that, how to get the best out of your agencies? Because there, there's clients listening what is it you want to know that they should do? <laughs> well, let me again stick to two or three principles, I suppose, that we've seen over time. And I'll try and make it as data-led as I can. So in terms of creativity, let's measure that by winning can lines. You know, it's as good a benchmark as anything. Longevity of relationship is incredibly important, right? So if you look at the chat, uh, at your the possibility of you winning a lion, right? The chances of you winning a lion by percentage. It starts here. And in the first couple of years, it goes up. So in the first two or three years, you've got more chance of winning a lion. And I kind of equate this a little bit like to a marriage. You know, things are really exciting. We're working together. We're doing great things. And then there's this dip, right? There's this dip for three or four years of... And all we've looked, this is across tens of thousands of pieces of work, right? This is a big data piece. There's a dip. And at that dip point, that is when so many marketers say goodbye to their agencies. But what happens in the subsequent years? The success rate goes like this, and it climbs and it climbs and it climbs and it climbs to be more than double what it was at the beginning of the relationship. Hmm. So the, the message there is, if you stick with your agency, you would be amazed about the results that happen because longevity, according to all of our data, longevity leads to better work, simple as that. So I think, I think the first thing is a new marketing leader comes in, they want a new agency. Agency's done something wrong, we want a new agency. Procurement have told us we've got to cut costs, we need, need a new agency. Our data tells us, that that's not the right thing to do. Sticking with your agency is a better thing to do. So that's the first thing. Well, before Second, you go to the next one, I'd like to just unpack it a little because now I want to know why. And so first, why the dip? How do you explain the dip? And what is it that perhaps we can do to actually counter that? Because maybe sometimes there isn't that dip. What do you? What's your explanation for the dip? Well, I think that the um, the first the first flush is because. The agency is investing a lot of time and energy in the relationship and everybody wants it to work. And I think that's that explains the first flush. Yeah. 
the, 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 the long-term gain, the, the, the quality of the work in the long-term is really explained by trust, yeah. understanding, and belief in each other. Yeah. And I suppose I don't have an answer for the dip, but it's between those two things. It's neither of those two things. We're not excited. And, you know, we haven't got that level of trust. Yeah. Bringing forward that, that genuine trust, I think, is, 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 is another, what we see anyway, is a really, really big part of it. Yeah. Um, what I hear from agencies is we're paid to do a particular kind of job. We're paid to push our marketers. We're paid to make them feel uncomfortable. And we want them to allow us to do that. We want them to trust us to do that. David Droger once said to me this really interesting thing. We were having lunch and he said, do you know the most terrifying thing that a marketing, a CMO can say to me? I said, no. And he said, we trust you. He said, that is terrifying. I'll tell you why. Because suddenly there's no get out. There's no, well, you made us do this and you made us do that. Huh. The marketer is saying, I trust you. Now come back to me with the work. And he said, you wouldn't believe how that elevates everybody's thinking because there's nowhere to hide. They trust us. So, so I think what I hear from agents is that over and over again, that desire to be trusted. And I know it's very easy to say, mm. but that's the data. And then the, and then the, the, the other thing I would say is we do, we do it is our opinion, quite strong opinion, that the language is different when we're talking about creativity. And a couple of data points here. Mm. So Leo Burnett, it was that designed a kind of template, a ladder of creative discussions. Because what they realized was when they sit with their agency and they say, what do you think of this piece of work? They say, I don't like it. You know, the marketers don't like it. Or I do like it. And nobody can even nobody can re, nobody in the room can say why. So they created a ladder, very famous ladder. I'm sure everybody knows about it. But they did create a ladder that was effectively saying, work from zero to nine or ten. Each part was described. This this work is this kind of work for these kind of reasons, and getting that alignment of language is absolutely critical because then you're starting to talk about the same thing and you're saying i think that's a five and the reason i think it's a five is because it's too similar to something i saw over there one of our competitors have done this before whatever the reason might be this is not top quality work for these reasons mm -hmm. and that description i think is important that that language we did a piece of research recently very interesting piece of research where we asked a simple question we asked the industry how important is creativity to you? And obviously, the cohort from the agency group said, extremely important, 9.5 out of 10. When we asked the marketers, how important is creativity to you? Also, very, very high, eight and a half, nine out of 10, incredibly high. But when we asked the agencies, how important do you think your marketers think creativity is? Mm. They, they they benchmark it very, very low. Huh. So what does that tell me? That tells me that the agencies don't believe the marketers truly believe in creativity. But that's only because they're talking about different things. They're talking about, you know, they are not on the same wavelength in terms of what do we mean by great creativity? And this is the unlock. This is the, this is the thing that unlocks everything. When you talk to... Uh, partnerships that have worked for many years, Widen and Kennedy and Nike or whoever it might be, Snickers and BBDO, people who've gone for many, many years, you can see the success they've had and you can see that it's based on we know what we're talking about when we're talking about creativity. But it's, um, it's a very interesting subject, but it is boils down to those, those things, I think it really does. Common language, trust. And, then and longevity. Longevity, yeah. yeah. Philip, I, I, I want to thank you for making the time. Um, I've got a, a closing question, which I ask everybody that I speak to, which is that really practically, there's a lot of marketing leaders listening to this conversation. And of course, they want to drive creativity and they probably make the mistakes that you just described when they talk to their agencies about it. But so can we get really practical? What are your top recommendations for marketers to do practically? I think if uh, 
if you're talking about creativity, the the number one thing is to I think is to start small and to start um, risk free or as risk free as possible, because what that allows you to do is two things. Firstly, you can keep under the radar and sec of the finance people and all of those guys. And secondly, you can really trust the agency. So that where I've seen it works so well, and what this does is it just builds creative confidence. Is and and to be, if you look, if you really look at the work that Fernando did at Burger King, this was not expensive. This was not ten million dollars in media costs. It was not expensive. And if you look at the great stuff that Unilever have done, that that, that Coca Cola have done, that McDonald's have done, Burger King, it's not the expensive. Things right, so I think the number one thing would be we're going to ring ring fence a budget. It's going to be a small budget. It's going to be a constrained budget, and we're going to give it to you as our partner agency group. And you are not going to have any constraints from us whatsoever. And if it's a disaster, we'll all just have to learn from it. But let's start slow. And this is the thing we've seen so many times, and it just then it just builds and builds and builds and builds, because uh, it gives you that confidence, that creative confidence. Mm. So that's the one thing I would say: if you can, it doesn't matter how big your but marketing budget is, take two percent of it. You can do amazing things with a small budget. Yeah, so it's it's really the design thinking approach: start yeah. small and iterate and iterate, and very clear. Philip Thomas, uh, we'll see you in a matter of weeks. Uh, exciting that so many people are now indeed coming. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your insights. And to everyone else, uh, we'll see you in Cannes. This is the end of this year's Humanizing Growth Series. And how appropriate to do that with the chairman of the Cannes Lions Festival for Creativity, Philip Thomas and everyone. Thank you and have a great weekend.